right, hi everyone and welcome to Friday Q&A, a webinar series produced by the UF Thompson Earth Systems Institute Scientists in Every Florida School Program and the Community Scholars Initiative. Each Friday at 3 p.m. for 30 minutes, a scientist will present on their area of expertise, followed by a question and answer session. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEFS program connects, builds long-term partnerships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms in Florida and beyond. The Community Scholars Initiative is based at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida. Our goal is to connect, create, and elevate educational experiences in the classroom and our community. Supported by the Lake Nona community, we facilitate programs in both Orange and Osceola County schools and work with community leaders and businesses to build out of school learning programs. During the COVID-19 school closures, we are happy to partner with CEFs to continue engaging with our students, teachers, and parents in a digital platform. Today, we are joined by Loggerhead Marine Life Center staff members, Sarah Hirsch, Senior Manager of Research and Data, Dr. Max Poliak, Associate Staff Veterinarian, Dr. Justin Peralt, Director of Research, Jennifer Riley, Research Operations Manager, and Hannah Campbell, the Director of Education. The Loggerhead Marine Life Center, or LMC, is a nonprofit organization focused on ocean conservation. As you can see, the LMC staff is made up of veterinarians who work in their sea turtle hospital, educators who bring science to the community and classrooms, and biologists who conduct research studies to better understand marine turtles and their habitat use. It just so happens to be Endangered Species Day today, just in time to talk about these threatened and endangered sea turtles with staff scientists from Loggerhead Marine Life Center. We hope you enjoy this special session for this very special Endangered Species Day. As our experts tell you about their work, please add your questions into the chat, including your name, age, and who your question is for, and one of our moderators will ask your questions. In addition, one of our panelists, Jen, is deaf and will be utilizing the chat box for her portion of this panel. Please be sure to keep your chat box open for Jen's talk. And with that, I'll hand it over to our panel. All right, I'll get it started. I am um, kind of, I'm Dr. Justin Peralt. I'm the director of research at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. Um, I wanted, I thought it was kind of funny that Sarah posted a photo of her with this big giant loggerhead and I have this little tiny dinky green turtle. So from here on, I'll have to think about um, my photos. Um, so we all kind of did a kind of similar format here and how did we get to Loggerhead Marine Life Center? Um, so I was born in New England in Springfield, Massachusetts, and then moved to uh, Memphis, Tennessee when I was around three or four. So the early portion of my life, I was pretty much, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of water around me. I didn't have an ocean, you know, environment directly next to me. Um, but we always had lots of dogs and cats and animals in our house, and we really welcomed everything from spiders to dogs to birds to fish. Um, and so that's kind of where my love of animals really started. Um, after graduating from high school, I want, knew that I wanted to do marine biology, and so I then um, applied to a number of different schools, um, kind of on the eastern coast and the Atlantic Ocean, and was accepted into the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, where I did a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology. Um, during that time, around my junior and senior year, I also um, was a paid intern position. I got really lucky with that. Um, as an educator at one of our local aquariums, and then they hired me on after until the remainder of my time at the university. Um, I always knew that I wanted to get a PhD, so after graduating from college, I, um, or during college, I, I applied to a number of PhD programs. Um, I was always interested in kind of charismatic megafauna, which are the kind of the really large animals like, you know, sharks, marine mammals, sea turtles that people are really uh, familiar with. And I was accepted into the PhD, Integrative Biology PhD program at Florida Atlantic University um, down in Boca Raton. I um, spent a little bit too long at FAU. My PhD took me about seven years, but it was a, you know, I really, um, I got a lot out of it. I did a, a really great uh, thesis. Um, and after that, you know, you would think after 11 years of college that you would be done with your education, but no. Um, so then after that, I applied to some postdoctoral research positions. Um, I was accepted into the one at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, um, where I was there for two years. And they kind of had a dual program as well, where um, it was mostly a research position, but 
Um, they also offered us the opportunity to teach a number of different classes and labs at the local um, university, um, which was USF in Sarasota. And so I was able to kind of do everything that you do after you get a PhD at Moat. I was able to do my own research. I was able to teach to really get a feel for where I wanted my career to go. Um, after about two years, two and a half years at Moat, my postdoc was up. Um, and so I started applying for professor positions and was um, taken as a visiting assistant professor at University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. Um, that position was primarily teaching and didn't have a lot of research um, that went along with it. So I did, I do love teaching. I absolutely, you know, I, 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 I excelled at it. I really thought I, it was a skill that I was um, good at, but I was really starting to miss the kind of the research that went along with, you know, the whole reason that I got my PhD. So one day out of the blue, Loggerhead Marine Life Center called me and said that they were looking to take their research department to the next level. Um, it's kind of an interesting story because I did actually a lot of my PhD research while at FAU with the Logger, with Loggerhead Marine Life Center as a collaborator. So my whole kind of educational experience from graduate school now to my career has kind of come full circle and placed me back to where it really all started. And so now um, I am the director of research um, at Loggerhead and um, we run a great department. Um, Stephanie, if you don't mind advancing the slide for me. All right, oh, back one, yeah, thank you. So <laughs> back one. Um, so what does the director of research do? You know, here I put a lot of fun pictures of turtles up because a lot of us scientists, we spend a lot of the time in front of the computer and those pictures aren't very interesting. So I showed you most of our photos from the field. Um, so as the director of research, I, my, my roles are multi, I have multifaceted roles. Um, I do a lot of grant writing um, to try to bring money into the department for different research projects. Um, I do a lot of uh, acquiring permits that are necessary to work with endangered species like sea turtles. Um, a lot of publication writing as well. It takes up kind of the majority of my time. And then now we're really lucky because this time of year it is nesting sea turtle season on Florida's East Coast, um, which runs from March through October. And so we're out there during the day and the night um, documenting and monitoring all of the nesting sea turtle activities and interacting with and encountering the animals as well and tagging them and taking a number of different samples. So here I've kind of just outlined a few um, of the different research projects that we do um, in our department. So many of you on here right now are from Florida and you're probably very familiar with um, red tide. Red tide is a, it's a harmful algal bloom that releases potent neurotoxins that are toxic to a number of different marine animals, um, including sea turtles. And these turtles come in to rehab facilities and they're, you know, they have tremors, they're shaking, they can often become comatose and the survival rate is often very low. And with um, the collaboration with our rehabilitation department at LMC, we've developed a drug therapy that helps um, counteract these symptoms and these animals are recovering in about a day and their survival rate increased by about 30% with this new drug therapy that we're giving to sea turtles exposed to red tide toxins. Um, we also do a lot of things with nest temperatures, you know, climate change is a big um, research topic that people are looking at right now. So we, you can, what you're looking at here is kind of the rear end, this middle photo on the top is the rear end of the turtle, that's her cloaca where the eggs are coming out of. And then that kind of black spot that you see in the nest, that is a, a temperature data logger. So we insert those into the nest during, um, while the sea turtle is laying her eggs and that records the nest temperatures every 30 minutes. And so we can look at temperatures in relation to reproductive success, um, in relation to hatchling health, um, in relation to uh, seasonal changes in temperature, um, a lot of things like that. So we have data loggers that are out on our beach monitoring nest temperatures right now. Um, another thing that we've been doing is kind of these tag recapture studies of animals. So the Leatherback Project in particular, um, has been going on for about 20 years. And so we go out there and drive the beach back and forth every night and we're looking for nesting sea turtles. And particularly when leatherbacks come up, we um, check them for tags, we see who they are. Some of our animals have a 
20 year history of, of nesting on our beaches. And we can look at growth rates through time, you know, different injuries that these animals might experience, um, how long it takes the animals to come back um, year after year and things like that. Um, so you may be wondering what the heck is going on in this picture on the bottom left. Um, that is a leatherback turtle in a harness. Um, we do a lot of animal, my, my primary research focus is um, animal health. And so this study, we brought a tripod out onto the beach and weighed these leatherback turtles on the nesting beach and then re related those weights of the, of the females to physiological measures of health. Um, so you see that turtle, it looks like the scale is reading about 279 kilograms. It's about a 700, 650, 700 pound animal. Um, you know, we put them back down, draw their blood, do we, you know, measure them, do all kinds of things with them. So that was a really unique study. Um, there's also, you know, we're not just limited to the nesting beach um, with our research. We do some studies um, all around in Florida's waters. This one in particular is from uh, the Indian River Lagoon. So we're looking at biotoxins from harmful algal blooms in these animals and um, and relating those toxin loads to immune function and overall health in green turtles and loggerheads that are inhabiting the lagoon. And then something that we've kind of really ramped up recently is um, the picture on the bottom right um, is uh, injury prevalence studies. This turtle that's shown there, that's Lucy. She's a nesting leatherback turtle with an over, she was tagged originally in 2001 and it's still returning to our local beaches. So we see her every few years. And unfortunately, last year, you can see she was hit by a boat unintentionally. So each one of those kind of wounds that you see is a propeller wound on that animal. And what we're doing is kind of documenting and monitoring these different injuries on different species on our beaches to see what the biggest threats are to sea turtles um, locally. And we do find that unintended boat strikes are, are very common. Um, about 10% of our nesting females have been hit by uh, unintentionally by a boat. So you can kind of see all of these questions really tie together into animal health overall and how we can use health of these animals to make informed conservation decisions. Um, if animals that we're studying aren't healthy, then conservation cannot happen. And so that's where kind of my career has led is to um, understanding and monitoring health and um, to you know, inform conservation decisions. So that's it for me. I think Sarah's up next. Hey guys, uh, so I'm Sarah Hirsch. I am the Senior Manager of Research and Data at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. Um, so I work closely with Justin and Jen, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Um, so again, kind of following that same format, how on earth did I get to where I am right now? Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, um, born and raised there. Um, I kind of at looking for colleges, knew I wanted to get a little bit away from home, so started looking uh, out of state. Uh, my parents were not happy about that, but um, out of state for colleges. Um, and I wanted to kind of keep an open mind. I was interested in biology, marine biology, since I was a little kid, um, but everybody kept telling me that you change your mind over time, uh, you know, keep your options open. So I kind of took a different route. Um, instead of going into a marine biology program, I went into a general biology program and just looked for uh, basically a college that provided a general liberal arts background so that if I wanted to fail on biology, I had some other backups uh, in my back pocket. Um, turns out I stuck with it. So, you know, you never know where you're going to end up. But um, so after I graduated from Wake Forest, um, I started taking some internships uh, just to kind of narrow down my interests. Uh, the field of biology, even the field of marine biology is actually a very large field. And there are a whole bunch of different uh, jobs within that area. And so um, I was basically encouraged to take internships. They're short term. So if you hate it, it you're only, you know, spending three months of your time uh, doing that. And so that's what I did. I, I kind of 
took a bunch of internships to figure out what I would be interested in. So I started off uh, with the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District, um, looking at uh, the health of the, the streams and the watershed in the area. Um, and I liked it, but again, I was kind of more interested in marine environments instead of freshwater environments. Um, so my next step was to try and get into um, an internship that introduced me really to the marine environment. So uh, before I could do that, I did have to make some money. A lot of internships uh, in the biology conservation field are unpaid and that can make it a little bit challenging. So uh, before I moved on, I did a summer uh, with the National Transportation Safety Board. It had nothing to do with biology. It was just a job that I found that paid well. Um, I will say that it was a good learning experience for me. Um, it was a job where I had to put on a suit and go into downtown DC every day and I was miserable. Um, and I knew that that wasn't for me. I did not want to end up in a job where I had to wear a suit to work. Um, that just sounded horrible. Uh, it was horrible for three months, um, but it got me the money I needed to then move on to other uh, internships. So I moved on to uh, Assateague Island National Seashore. Uh, in Maryland. And there I did, again, uh, water quality stuff, but I was more uh, transferring into the marine environment. Um, so I was monitoring the uh, health of the uh, ocean and of the intercoastal in that area for that internship. And then my third internship was with Moat Marine Laboratory. Um, so you heard Justin talk about Moat. They have a uh, a lot of programs there. They offer a lot of great internships for a variety of different fields uh, from sea turtles, sharks, dolphins, manatees, uh, seahorses, seagrasses, corals. Um, they do a lot there. Um, and so that was my first kind of experience into research and what research could be. Um, and it was also my first introduction to sea turtles. And so I say I kind of fell into sea turtles because I took this internship not really knowing much about them, um, but I fell in love with them through the internship. And I was lucky enough to be asked back first as a seasonal technician. So I, I finally got paid, yay. Um, and then eventually I was hired on as a staff biologist there. Um, and I loved it at Moat. Um, it was a, a great experience, but I kind of had hit my, my cap, so to speak, at that organization. And so um, when something opened up at Loggerhead Marine Life Center, I jumped at it. And um, so I have been at Loggerhead now for about six years. Um, and I actually also just started going back to get my master's degree. So I'm actually currently also a student at Florida Atlantic University. Um, so you can tell by uh, all of these that some of us have some overlapping uh, associations. Um, so my advisor right now at FAU is actually uh, Justin's advisor for his PhD, um, and we very briefly overlapped at Moat. I don't think we ever interacted. It was maybe like a couple weeks, but um, we did overlap there a little bit. So um, the connections you make while you're doing these internships are crucial. Um, so another reason to do these internships, not just to figure out what you want to do, but it also gets you connections within the field. And so that's a really important uh, part of doing these internships. So I really encourage uh, young folks to go out and, um, and take these different um, short term experiences to really um, not boost their resume, but also kind of, you know, make those connections and all that stuff. So with that as my background, uh, what do I do? So this first slide um, 
like Justin kind of hinted at, I wanted to show you the good part of the job, right? This is the part of the job that everybody gets to see. And they're like, oh my gosh, I want to do your job. It looks amazing because you get to do all this cool research. Um, so in the top corner there, I am uh, using an ultrasound machine to look at the aorta of a nesting loggerhead sea turtle. So this was in collaboration with our rehab department. Um, we were looking at endarteritis, so an inflammation of the aorta caused by a blood fluke. Um, and so we wanted to look at the prevalence of this condition in our nesting turtle. Um, so that's what I'm doing that top photo. Uh, the next one over uh, is me drawing blood from a leatherback sea turtle. So again, Justin kind of talked about a lot of those health studies um, that our department works on. Um, down on the bottom is uh, the giant loggerhead uh, from an in-water study. So um, we actually get to go out with collaborators and catch these giant turtles as they're swimming in the water and bring them on board and again take a whole bunch of uh, samples from them to learn about their health and where they've been. Um, the next photo in the center bottom is me uh, applying a satellite transmitter to a nesting loggerhead. So this is actually part of my uh, master's research and um, a project that we just started this year. Um, and we are uh, looking at the number of times these loggerheads nest in one season. Um, so we always go out and I'm sure you guys have seen reports of the number of nests that are laid on the beach, uh, but the number of nests doesn't equate to the number of females in the population because a single female will actually deposit multiple nests on the beach in one season. And so what our study is trying to look at is how many nests an individual will contribute in a season. And that can help us figure out how many uh, females are actually in that population. Um, and again, this is super important to uh, protect a species. One of the main things you need to know is how many exist. Um, and for sea turtles, it's actually a little bit harder to figure out than one might think. And so um, that's what that research project is, is looking at. Um, the next picture over is me with a, a green turtle, a little juvenile green turtle, again, with some of those in-water studies. Um, and then just a fun photo of me on an ATV. Again, these are kind of the glorified photos. Um, so on the next slide, I wanted to show you guys kind of um, the, the flip side of what our job looks like. Um, it's not always glorious photos. So your days are spent digging into deep holes in the sand. That's me in probably a three or four foot hole that I dug by hand only because we can't use any tools because there are eggs and turtles. Uh, beneath the sand surface. So we dig everything with our hands. So um, in the middle of a Florida summer, you can get pretty hot. Uh, you're pretty sandy. I, it doesn't matter how many times I take a shower between March 1st and October 31st, which is sea turtle season, I will always have sand on me. It's just part of the job. Um, you also get rained on. So last night I got rained on all night. Um, so I just wanted to show that, you know, we glamorize some of it and it is great and we love what we do, but there are uh, downsides to it. On the bottom left there, you can see uh, an ATV that broke down. I had to change a tire on the beach. Um, so you learn to be resourceful uh, in things that you would have never thought about relating to your job, um, but, there are skill sets that are not just related to turtles that can be helpful um, as you uh, kind of work your way through your career. Um, and then as Justin alluded to, a lot of our job is actually sitting in front of a computer. So that's that big picture right there. Uh, 
sitting in front of a computer, there's a big stack of data sheets um, in the foreground that you can see those uh, multicolored data sheets. Um, so as the manager of the, the data that comes in from our beaches, um, it means a lot of time staring at numbers, staring at the computer, staring at spreadsheets. Um, so again, part of the job that people might not think about as being at the forefront of what we do. Um, and then again, as Justin uh, mentioned, uh, writing publications, writing grants to do our research um, is, is another big part of what we do. So sitting in front of the computer does take up quite a bit of our time. I think that's it for me. So I'll pass it over to Max. You're on, Max. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Max, Max Polyak. I am the uh, one of the veterinarians at Loggerhead Marine Life Center here. I am um, a little bit of, have a different background um, than um, most people that you have met that um, are veterinarians. And um, so I'm going to share that background and that journey with you in a few slides here. Um, I am from, originally from Southern California, from coastal uh, San Diego. Uh, the town called Del Mar is my hometown. And I grew up um, on the ocean, um, surfing and around marine life um, since I can remember. Um, much like the people on this panel, um, I was drawn to animals from a very young age. I was, I was lucky that my father was a veterinarian and uh, my brother is one too. So I was around all kinds of creatures uh, growing up. And, uh, but I did not go uh, straight to veterinary school even though I was very attracted to the profession. Um, so how does someone become a sea turtle veterinarian? Well, there isn't one route and there aren't very many of us um, around, but um, this is one of the ways uh, and, and in particular my way of making it to what I do uh, now today at Loggerhead. So, um, I went to college at USC in Los Angeles. Um, I was actually uh, recruited there. I was a, a collegiate athlete and I played water polo, which is a big sport in California. So I uh, had a scholarship. I was very fortunate to um, have that and, and play um, in college. And I earned a bachelor's with a double major in international relations and mathematics. So um, nothing really related to science. Um, and in doing that, uh, in, my, in my experience in college, I did start to dabble in, in marine science more and more in my local San Diego area, specifically with the marine animal program that the US Navy um, conducts in, in San Diego at the, at the naval base there. And I had access uh, because of my father a, a, as, a, as, a, as a veterinarian there, and he had contacts and worked with the Navy. So um, I decided to kind of change my, my view of, uh, of a career. And um, I decided to pursue actually human medical school. So I didn't have the prerequisites um, needed to apply. So I decided to go back to grad school to make those prereqs up and um, earned a scholarship to go overseas to the University of Cambridge over in England. So I spent a couple of years there getting a master's degree in uh, molecular biology, which this is uh, in the 90s. Um, that was a uh, uh, really kind of new field. Um, we take molecular genetics and, and anything molecular now kind of for, for granted, but in the 90s, it was, it was fairly new. And I did my work on the comparative um, gastrointestinal physiology and actually the microbiome of um, variety of species, particularly uh, ext uh, animals of extreme physiologies like uh, deep diving mammals, whales, dolphin, uh, whales and uh, walruses and things like that. So I was fascinated by that. So I, I got my prereqs done, I did well in school and I came back um, 
to and started a research job in the organ transplant field at uh, New York Hospital, um, which is a teaching hospital of Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Cornell University is in upstate New York, but the medical college is in is in Manhattan. And um, I was on my way to medical school there. So um, during that time, prior to starting human medical school, uh, the research I was doing um, started to develop very, very nicely. And I ended up um, actually inventing some things that helped organs function better in, in, in humans. And so the picture there on the bottom is what I invented, which is uh, basically an artificial life support machine for organs. And that's a, that's a human kidney sitting there in the middle. And so um, I was just about to start school having done this and I had you know sort of like a crisis and I had to ask myself, what do, what do I really wanna do? And I never really, really wanted to be a doctor, a human doctor. So I gave up my seat and um, my mentor at the time, a transplant surgeon said, you know, you should start a company around what you invented and see where it goes. You're a young guy and you, you, know, you have nothing to lose. Um, I certainly had no money, so I, I couldn't, couldn't lose any money. <laughs> um, but I ended up doing that. So I built a company around um, my technology in the organ transplant field. And along the way, I learned a lot of things, a lot of things about business, a lot of things about science, about the regulatory world, the FDA, um, and um, ended up uh, getting to a point where I realized, you know, this wasn't for me. I, I like the science a lot, but I don't like the business world necessarily. So I ended up selling the company and kind of went back to, you know, what have I always wanted to do? And I was always drawn to uh, that concept again from when I was very young of marine animals and marine animal medicine. So I kind of refined it then. And um, I decided, you know, I'm gonna do this. So I started vet school kind of later in life. Um, not straight out of college. So I was kind of like the crazy old uncle in my vet uh, class. I was in my 30s and everyone else was in their 20s. Um, but I sought out the University of Florida, in particular the, vet the veterinary college there, because they had the best reputation uh, for training in marine animal medicine. And that's what I did. And so I went, I got my DVM there. I don't know if the formatting shows up on your screen. It's not on mine, but so I got DVM, for those of you who don't know, is Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, is a professional veterinary degree. And I got uh, advanced training um, in aquatic animal medicine. They have a, a very robust aquatic animal medicine program there. And um, that's what I did. And so um, during that time, um, the medical school at the University of Florida, when I was in vet school, called me up and they said, hey, we heard you're in vet school down here. This was the transplant guys. And they said, you know, do you mind helping us do, put some of those machines you developed in our transplant division here on, across the street from the vet school? So I said, sure. And so I ended up doing that and I became adjunct faculty at the University of Florida's College of Medicine. Um, and I made in the Department of Surgery and I maintain that position today um, after say 10 years. So I worked full time in vet school um, doing that mostly at night because most transplant surgeries are done in the middle of the night. I wouldn't recommend going to vet school full time and working full time. It wasn't, wasn't uh, a lot of sleepless nights, but it can be done if you have to. So I ended up doing uh, that and finishing vet school and um, was involved in, uh, in founding, um, as a founding veterinarian rather, the Sea Turtle Hospital at the Whitney Laboratory, which is part of the University of Florida. So University of Florida's main campus where the vet school and the medical school are in, in Gainesville, Florida, and their Sea Turtle Hospital is on a coastal campus in St. Augustine. Um, and that is where their Sea Turtle Hospital was, is, was built and is still functioning. It's smaller than LMC's, much smaller. And it, right now it's focused on a very specific disease process that requires the animals to be kind of in permanent quarantine. So they can't accept um, sea turtles that were say hit by a boat or something like that. They only treat animals that are affected with a disease called fibropapillomatosis. Um, but I maintain a relationship uh, with the sea turtle hospital there as well. Um, and so as my sea turtle kind of career, medicine career started going, I sought out um, 
opportunities to teach overseas. And there, there are a lot of rehab places around the world, not nearly as advanced as, as, as loggerheads, but um, nonetheless, um, they're very, very active and very busy and in, and, in, and in strong need of clinical training and, and, and in need of people with clinical experience with these species. So um, I was able to, over the last 10 years, I teach regularly in Thailand, um, Maldives. Uh, Maldives is a bunch of small islands in the Indian Ocean, beautiful place. Uh, Belize and Costa Rica in Central America and um, Maine. And Maine uh, doesn't really have a whole lot of sea turtles, they, they do. Um, but I teach a sea turtle rehab class um, online there um, through a through Unity College, and th that's why I added that. But I get uh, one of the great things about this job, uh, not just being here in Juneau Beach, Florida, um, is that I get to go around the world uh, and and train new veterinarians and and train rehab staff and work with researchers like uh, we have on this panel. You know, um, we have a, a really robust and and world class research effort. At loggerhead, uh, uh, you know, the, my panelists colleagues are probably are uh, being, you know, uh, modest about it, but it's a big time research program here, and um, I'm I'm really lucky to be a part of their effort as well. Um, but some of the research that they do are in places and with collaborators, like in these countries, and um, so it's exciting to be able to build these bridges uh, on the research side for uh, Dr. Justin and Sarah um, and, um, and Jen, who you'll meet in a second, and um, also with our clinical uh, um, people, the veterinarians that I work with overseas. So it's really, really great, great work. Um, there's a step before I became the vet here, one of the vets here at Loggerhead, and that is that picture there, Jungle Friends Primate Sanctuary. So one of my other real passions is uh, non-human primate in general uh, and non-human primate medicine specifically. So monkeys and apes, that's what that means. But I love new world monkeys in particular. And I had the opportunity to be the medical director um, at Jungle Friends Primate Sanctuary, which is in Gainesville, Florida too. It's the largest new world uh, monkey sanctuary in North America, by the way. They, we have over 330 uh, monkeys there that are living there um, permanently um, and they are retired from medical research. So the group I was involved with there, um, they asked me to come because I was uh, kind of a wildlife vet and I had experience with the FDA from my human uh, medical uh, background. And what I was responsible for was the very first transfer of any animal species ever by the FDA to a sanctuary. And I was really proud and really excited to be a part of it. They're called the FD, FDA boys, 24 squirrel monkeys who were released by the FDA after a nicotine study and um, were uh, brought to the sanctuary for the rest of their lives. So um, they were ages between eight and 15 years old and they live to about 60. So they have a long life ahead of them. And they are, and I was responsible for their welfare, their health and the transition from cages effectively to this neotropical neo bliss that they live in now. And to give you a perspective, you know, these monkeys, you think, oh, they love to jump around in trees and all that, which they do. But if they're, if they're pulled from the wild when they're babies and they're brought into a laboratory environment, which these monkeys were, they, they didn't even know what a tree was. And we had to introduce them very gradually to even a leaf to start with, because their whole lives, their existence was, was a cage. So um, that, that's where that little kind of um, side tour came in. And I was really lucky to be a part of it. And um, I still love uh, monkeys uh, dearly. And, uh, but I did make my way eventually to uh, Loggerhead Marine Life Center. And I joined here uh, very recently, um, actually uh, in early February, but in advance of that, I had been a volunteer veterinarian here for about just a little over a year. Um, so it was a very, very long uh, job interview, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> They got to, uh, everyone here got to sort of vet me for a year and I got to meet everyone and, and the transition has been great. Um, and the, uh, and the growth here is, is, is super exciting. We're in the middle of an expansion, which is just unbelievably awesome. Um, but how about, um, let's talk about, or I'll talk about what I do as a sea turtle vet here at Loggerhead. So what we are really, um, 
uh, sort of focused on and driven by uh, as a mission, um, the Sea Turtle Hospital and the department, the rehab department here, is kind of like the concept of a, of a sea turtle university. And we are a teaching hospital in, in, that, in that paradigm. Um, we heard about the research kind of department within the Sea Turtle University model already. We are like the teaching hospital side of that. So we have a, a large outdoor hospital and we have a very um, advanced indoor hospital. Uh, the outdoor hospital is analogous to say um, cages in a vet hospital uh, for dogs and cats or beds in a human hospital. And the indoor hospital is more of like the ICU and the kind of critical care portion of, of, of my practice. And what we do here is rehab, we, you know, we, we do sea turtle medicine, but that's kind of, we have to play, we have to be a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, a cardiologist, and a gastroenterologist, we have to be everything at once. Um, but ultimately what we practice here is conservation medicine. And most of the time when you hear that term, you think of zoos and things that are breeding critically endangered animals to reintroduce them back into the wild. But there's another aspect of conservation medicine, which is uh, treating endangered species that um, strand and that are, are sick and dying um, uh, coming from their native habitat and uh, treating them rehabbing them and then releasing them back into the wild so that they can contribute again to their species and to their larger ecosystems. So um, although I am a you know sea turtle cardiologist one day and a sea turtle dermatologist another day, what Dr. Charlie and I uh, practice, he's the head veterinarian here, um, is conservation medicine. And some of the pictures here kind of um, outline that and describe it. And uh, the outdoor hospital, the sort of beds in a hospital uh, model example that I gave you is a picture on the top left of a bunch of tanks. And it's, uh, you know, I come in the morning and I round on my patients. Um, and it's wonderful, the, pit, the public's not here yet. And I, I, you know, I learn so much more from my patients than I could ever learn in a book or, or, or certainly what, any more than I can give them as a, as a, as a clinician. So it's really gratifying um, to be able to treat these species. But I round uh, on them in the morning and I do in the evening again. Um, and, you know, I kind of look for signs and things. What are they telling me, what, um, you know, as they're swimming? What's their mentation, which is a clinical term for like their behavior? Are they feeling okay? How, how are they eating? Um, are they moving all right, you know, or are they not? And, and in their silence, they, uh, to, to an, uh, an observer who, who's really what I am is uh, they can tell me a lot. And so that's what happens in the outdoor hospital um, on a sort of uh, doctor to patient uh, basis. Um, and then the crowd, the crowds come, the general public comes, our guests, uh, and they really love it. And we really love teaching and interacting with them. And then it gets busy and then we have treatments and so forth, which I'm going to walk you through here too. Um, so in addition to our role as you know, a teaching hospital, you know, a resource to, to train veterinarians and, and we have veterinary externs, which are like senior students at veterinary school coming through here all the time. We have interns in the rehab department constantly um, is um, the teaching component. And the second picture is uh, my colleagues at the Marine Endangered Species Veterinary Hospital over in Thailand. And that is well, one of my classes there and they have a, a fantastic hospital. Um, and fortunately in that country, the king, uh, the royal family is really into conservation of the environment, of their marine environment. And specifically, they have a, a real love of sea turtles, just like all of us do. Um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will go uh, there on, on a yearly basis and exchange information and clinical techniques and so forth um, pretty regularly. Well, now with the pandemic, um, maybe not, but... Um, some of the other pictures are just kind of clinical things that we do here. There, that, that's me there in a surgery. Um, the two pictures together, um, that was a fishing hook. And the middle picture is a radiograph, like an x-ray with a contrast medium. So you can see the, the kind of the bright white portion. That's the turtle's stomach. And at the very end of the turtle's stomach is a little, with the arrow was pointing is a hook, a fishing hook that he ingested. And the picture on the left is a surgery uh, to pull it out. And that zoom, that picture is the actual hook after it has been removed from his stomach. So it's really gratifying and awesome to be able to do these kinds of surgeries on these animals. Yeah. 
bottom left is one of my clinical, one of our clinical research efforts um, that we're working on at the moment, which is figuring out sea turtle blood types. We don't even know what they are. Um, and specifically um, figuring out uh, how, what is the safest way to transfuse a patient that is critically anemic. So in, 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 in critical need of blood to keep it alive. And that is what is happening in that little green turtle there on the bottom left. Another um, uh, modality that we use is uh, HBOT, hyperbaric um, uh, oxygen therapy. And that is a turtle inside of a hyperbaric chamber at about two and a half atmospheres of pressure. That is used to um, sort of supersaturate their, the animal's tissues with, with oxygen because they're not ventilating properly. So they're not, being, they're not able to breathe um, appropriate enough to keep them alive. So that's another exciting um, uh, modality that we use here in the hospital. And next to that is a big giant green uh, mom who I'm ultrasounding and you can see in the image on the top, those little white dots are eggs. So this turtle stranded during the nesting um, season last year, and uh, she was uh, evaluated for, um, I forget, but some sort of a uh, um, fishing line is issue, but she was healthy and we released her. But in the meat, during that process, we ultrasounded her and found out she was gravid. Um, and that final picture there is another, uh, that's a large male uh, loggerhead um, that's being um, subjected to uh, an endoscopy, an, endoscopic study of his distal GI tract. And the picture on the top left is the inside of his um, the middle portion of his colon. So which is the last part of his uh, long gastrointestinal tract. Um, turtles don't, won't just sit there and let you do that. Um, he's sedated um, quite heavily and, and it's, we do this routinely. So this is something, uh, a no normal uh, course of, of, of in, a, in a day's work, so to speak. So I think I am running out of time, but that's kind of in a nutshell what, what I do and what we do on the clinical side at the teaching hospital here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. So I will hand it over, I believe, to Jen now. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. My name is um, Hannah, and I will be providing the vocal narrative for Jen today. Um, Jen says, hi, I'm Jen. I am from Farmingdale, New York. I grew up with a love for the ocean and never missed an opportunity to go to the beach. It was not until I went to high school when I enrolled in a marine biology class for an elective that I decided what I wanted to do for a living. I graduated from Southampton College at Long Island University for my bachelor's degree in biology with a marine concentration. I did many years of volunteer work at the Riverhead Foundation for Marine Research and Preservation, now renamed New York Marine Rescue Center, located out east on Long Island, where I assisted with the care of sick and injured seals and assisted with their seal watch cruises by scouting for and documenting the winter seal population in Hempstead Bay. Can you advance the slide? After graduating from Southampton, I moved to several states, but it was Michigan when a coworker introduced me to a deaf graduate student who lived out in Hawaii. She was seeking to recruit a team of deaf interns to assist her with her thesis research on hawksbill sea turtles and their foraging habits, habitats. Without hesitation, I applied and was accepted to work out in Hawaii for three months. There, I met my very first nesting sea turtle on the beach on Maui, a hawksbill. I was so in awe watching this turtle as she continued with her nesting process. From that point on, I knew what it was I wanted to do. <laughs> you can stay on the slide with the photos, please. To pursue my newfound passion for sea turtles, I immersed myself in my own studies in sea turtle biology and conservation. I spent one summer in Beaufort, North Carolina, where I took a graduate level course in the biology and conservation of sea turtles at Duke University's Marine Laboratory on Pivers Island. After completing the course, I decided I wanna go back to school for my master's and attended Stony Brook University. 
I needed to complete an internship as well as a capstone project as requirement for my master's in marine conservation and policy. While I was accepted to a few organizations, I chose to work with the Volusia County of Environmental Management under their sea turtle habitat conservation plan. There, I assisted with a few projects, including planning our local international coastal cleanup event and assisted with their daily morning surveys for sea turtle nesting activity in Daytona Beach and New Smyrna Beach. It was 2014 when I applied for and was accepted as a seasonal nesting field technician working in the research department at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. My responsibilities included documenting sea turtle nesting activities on a 9.5 mile stretch of beach in northern Palm Beach County, identifying each crawl to species and type. I also conducted sea turtle nest excavations. I loved working out in the field so much that I returned for two additional seasons in 2015 and 2016, and then I was offered the position as field operations assistant in 2018 before I was promoted to my current position of research operations manager. As the research operations manager, I oversee all data collection and field projects related to morning nesting beach surveys along 9.5 miles of beach monitored by our organization. I conduct daily nesting surveys and nest excavations, train and supervise seasonal nesting field technicians and interns. I assist Dr. Justin and Sarah with their innovative research projects, nesting beach survey data entry, verification and analysis in addition with the annual nesting season reports. I also work with other departments on various projects, including programming offered in American Sign Language or ASL through tours and nighttime turtle walks. Okay, that concludes Jennifer's um, presentation. So I believe Brian and Stephanie, we will be going to the question and answer portion of this. Just That's as a reminder for everybody, if you have any questions for Jennifer, just make sure you're typing them into the chat box. Thank you, Hannah. So as Hannah said, we are gonna move into our question and answer portion of today's presentation. Our first question is going to be for Jen. Molly asks, do sea turtles have personalities? Do you have a favorite sea turtle that you work with or released? So for those viewers listening, Jen will be assigning her answers and then providing me with text that I'll then put in the text box. Justin, our next question is for you. Jenny asks, outside of human activity, what is the biggest threat to sea turtles? Um, well, you know, I guess the answer has changed as we go along through the decades. But um, right now, I think the biggest threat that we see is definitely plastic pollution, um, as I would say, too, as well as climate change. So uh, plastic pollution, and this kind of goes along with some of the work that Dr. Max and Charlie do in the hospital, um, 
100% of our sea turtle, virtually 100% of our uh, patients that come into the sea turtle hospital at Loggerhead Marine Life Center have ingested some form of plastic. Um, we are also doing a, a number of other studies that are looking at um, chemical contaminants that are related to plastic. So many of you have, are familiar with like BPA or bisphenol A that's used to kind of harden plastic. So we look at a lot of those chemicals as well. Um, so, you know, it's really not just sea turtles that are impacted by these plastics. It's really every animal on the planet, including humans, that um, this impacts. And, you know, we're really just kind of now scratching the surface as to what those impacts are. Um, you know, if, if an animal is ingesting just a tiny piece of plastic, if it's a large animal, that might not be a big deal. But if you've got a lot of smaller animals that are really opportunistic feeders that will really eat anything and they're ingesting these plastic pieces that can cause um, perforation of the gut or it can block the gut as well and prevent food um, from passing, similar to kind of what Max showed you with the hook in there, it can cause some blockage similar to that. Um, so definitely plastic pollution, I would say, is, is the number one threat for um, sea turtles and really just our planet in general. Thank you. And we have time for just about two more questions. And our next question is for Sarah. Ivana asks, how many turtles do you guys work with per year? That's a great question. Um, so we are fortunate enough at Loggerhead Marine Life Center to be located just across the street from Juneau Beach. Um, and Juneau Beach hosts some of the highest density nesting for loggerheads in the world. Um, so that means we are able to do a lot of really cool research because we have a very large nesting population here. Um, so we cover about nine and a half miles of coastline in our survey area. And in that nine and a half miles last year, we documented uh, almost 21,000 nests. Um, so to kind of put that in perspective, that ends up being a nest every three feet or so. Um, so there are nests kind of everywhere out on the beach. And one thing we always try to uh, let people know and educate people about is that no matter what beach you're on, you always want to be aware of uh, what's out there and that you're sharing these habitats with different organisms, including sea turtles. And so on our beach, we can't possibly mark 21,000 nests, not just because it would be a lot of effort and time on our end, but also because it would prevent people from being able to go out and enjoy the beaches themselves because we would have stakes all over the place. Um, so just keep in mind when you're out on the beach enjoying uh, nature that there could be eggs buried beneath the sand of sea turtles. There could be other creatures that, are, uh, that you're sharing the beach with. So just kind of be respectful while you're out there. And our final question is actually for Sarah again. Sarah, Brittany asks, what do you think the biggest area of turtle research is that's yet to be done? Oh boy, <laughs> that's a hard question. I might have to hand this off to somebody else. Um, I, I think the challenging thing um, is that kind of again, as Justin kind of alluded to, there there's a change in what threats we're seeing with sea turtles over time. And so a, a few decades ago, maybe lighting was kind of at the forefront of our field. That was something we were really paying attention to. And it's definitely something that we're still concerned about and trying to address um, and, and educating people on reducing lights at night, um, light pollution, again, not just for sea turtles, but a lot of other organisms out there um, is, is detrimental. Um, but as, as time goes on, we're finding these, these new threats emerging. So as Justin touched on, uh, plastic pollution is really emerging right now as uh, a new hot topic and threat for sea turtles and something that um, a lot of research is kind of highlighting right now. Um, and so I think, again, as, as these trends kind of uh, pop up, we never really know where, where it's going to go or what's going to be on the forefront next. 
Um, but it's something that it, it's one of the reasons that we're out there every day uh, monitoring the nests on the beaches, doing this research, studying these turtles that are coming into rehab. That's really telling us what's going on in the population, right? So we, we like to say at Loggerhead Marine Life Center that the health of the ocean tells us the health of the planet and the sea turtles are really the sentinels out there telling us the health of the ocean. And we can get a lot of information from these sea turtles that are coming into rehab facilities and looking at what issues they're dealing with um, that really kind of tells us what issues are happening right now and what we need to address right now. Um, so I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't look into the future, um, but plastic pollution, climate change, those are kind of the ones that are um, on the forefront of everybody's mind right now. Well, thank you all so much for being with us. At this point, I'm gonna hand things over to Stephanie for some closing remarks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about sea turtles or even see live sea turtle nests on the LMC uh, sea turtle camera, you can do so by visiting the links that were included in the chat box at the beginning of the hour, also on our Facebook page. We want to thank everyone for joining us today on the call to learn more about wildlife careers and conservation, and a very special thank you to our panelists from Loggerhead Marine Life Center. Once again, our Friday Q&As with scientists take place weekly at 3 p.m., as part of a collaboration between the Scientists in Every Florida School program and the Community Scholars Initiative. You can learn more about both of our programs as well as our guests by visiting the websites you see on your screen now. You can also find a recording of today's program on the UF Thompson Earth Systems YouTube channel, along with great resources we've curated on the topic regarding today's topic. Uh, please be sure to visit um, and register for the next Friday Q&A. We'll talk about fish then. Thanks very much and we hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.